You're not going to read a newspaper the same way you're going to read a book of poetry. You have different expectations because they follow different rules. And apocalypse is much the same. Characteristic of this kind of literature are larger-than-life cosmic images that talk about very real and very present experiences that you and I come into contact with. And what makes things even more complicated for us is that most of the images and the pictures in the book of Revelation, they come from the Old Testament. In fact, all of them come from the Old Testament. Most of them from the books of the prophets, which is like our least favorite section to read in the Old Testament. So because of our biblical illiteracy, we look at this strange book with all these weird pictures and we don't know what to do with it, and so we're easily intimidated. But this is not a literal book. Neither is this a predictive book. There's a temptation to open up the book of Revelation alongside the evening news and go, oh my goodness, Iran just launched an attack against Israel. It's the end of times, end of days. It's in the book. It's right here. God help us all. That's not what this book is. It is not a fortune cookie. It is not Nostradamus. This is a book written 2,000 years ago to people who were in the middle of a very present struggle and needed a message. Now, that message is very timeless, but the most predictive aspect of this book is to look into the future and say, hey, guess what? God wins. That's the only prediction it makes, guys, and that's probably enough. Now, when we come to this book, we have all these strange images that we're going to unpack that have a message for today that speaks to our real lives that we encounter every single day. And the one we're going to look at this morning comes to us in the book of Revelation chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open up to Revelation 12. If you don't have your Bible, you can follow along on the screen behind, or you can download the FCC Monmouth app, and the sermon notes should be the very first item on the home screen. Tap that, you'll have your passages and your outline ready to roll. We got a lot to cover. We don't have enough time for all of it. I'm going to speak very frankly this morning. If I step on your toes, it's nothing personal. I'm not gunning for you. We just have a lot to say, and I don't have time to mince words. If you miss something, I'd encourage you to listen to the podcast. It comes out, if not this afternoon, Monday morning. A lot of messages in Revelation chapter 12. The one most important for our purposes this morning is really a revelation, if you will. You live in the middle of a war. Like right now, presently. You are in the middle of a great celestial conflict. You live in a war zone. It's described to us like this, chapter 12, verse 1. A great sign, we'll pause there, a sign, a vision, I saw something like, these are all phrases that show up throughout Revelation, which is a big indicator that we're not dealing with literal things. A sign points to something, right? So a sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Who is this strange lady with such a weird outfit? Who is she? Well, in a couple of verses, she's going to give birth to a a messianic figure, a savior who will rule over the earth with an iron scepter. It's Jesus. And so there's a temptation to read this and go, well, this lady must be Mary, the mother of Jesus, right? Understandable how we would guess that. Probably not the case, though. Because there's a lot of other imagery in this picture. For instance, this crown of 12 stars. The number 12 is a very important number in this book, and really throughout all the Bible. I mean, you think, how many tribes were there in Israel? There were 12. God's Old Testament people are symbolized by the number 12. Coincidentally, Jesus, as he's instituting this new covenant, he chooses a number of disciples. And he could have chosen six, he could have chosen 22, but Jesus chose 12 disciples, not a coincidence, because God's New Testament people, this new covenant is a continuation of what was before. 12 is synonymous with God's people. Book of Acts, chapter 19, the Apostle Paul goes to the city of Ephesus, and he preaches the gospel there, and a number of people are baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and Luke summarizes, he says, there were about 12 in all, which is, let's just be honest, that's a weird number to round to, is it not? We usually round to like tens or fives. There are 15, 20 people there, right? But 12, why not about 11 or about 14? Why about 12? Because it was a very deliberate choice. Luke is trying to communicate that, hey, the people of God aren't just Israelites in Jerusalem. They are extended into Gentiles across the ancient world, even in the city of Ephesus, which was in Greek. Twelve is the number of God's people. So when we look at the book of Revelation, this lady who is oftentimes synonymous with Israel in the Old Testament, she's depicted as, or it's depicted as a woman wearing twelve stars. This is Israel. 
This is God's people, we should say, not the nation of Israel. This is God's people. And from God's people comes this Savior. But before we read about the Savior, we've got to read about the enemy. Because this is a war, is it not? And we read about him in verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. What the heck? Like, here's this fancy lady minding her own business, and this weird, deformed dragon shows up. Who's this guy? Well, when you and I hear the word dragon, we probably think of something that kind of looks like this. This is sort of an anglicized depiction of a dragon, this quadrupedal lizard that breathes fire and has wings and everything. But when ancient Near Eastern people, like the people John was writing to, the book of Revelation, hear the word dragon, they oftentimes thought of something like this. Because the word dragon is synonymous, sometimes the exact same word as serpent, depending on the language you're reading. This enormous serpent showed up. Now, where have we seen this guy before? Yeah, he shows up all over the place. We can go back to the very first story, to the garden, where a serpent tempted mankind, where a serpent made war against God's people to separate his creation from the Creator. This is not a stranger. This is an age-old adversary, Satan himself. The enemy of God's people shows up to devour this coming Savior, Deliverer, who is Jesus. And we read about that throughout the New Testament. You can read about Jesus, and, and really from birth, Herod, King Herod, threatened by this idea that a king would come and, and depose him. He sends soldiers to the town of Bethlehem. They murder every boy who is two years and younger and attempts to, to just destroy this king before he's a threat. You think Herod was that smart? You think that was all him? He's like, yeah, let's kill a bunch of babies. No, th- this is the dragon waging war against the Messiah. You can go to Jesus' adulthood. First thing he does in his ministry, he goes into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he fasts for 40 days. He draws near to the Lord. He's attended to by angels. It's a time of preparation, but it's also a time of temptation where Satan shows up and says, you don't need to do this whole cross thing. Just worship me. I'll give you everything you want. There's warfare happening. Book of John, towards the end of Jesus' life, Judas Iscariot betrays the Lord. And John's very, he doesn't mince, mince a lot of words. He says he fell under the influence of Satan. And then you can just look at the cross, an instrument of death, where the Son of God died in what was appearing to be a great defeat. We read about this throughout the New Testament. There is a war raging here. We keep reading. We look at verse, uh, verse 5. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will... Rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. This child is born, but before the dragon can do his deeds, he is whisked away to heaven. Now that, well, hold up now. Wait, we just talked about all the stuff Jesus had to go through. Like he died. Like, does Revelation skip over some stuff? And this is a really important point. We oftentimes think of the cross as this, we still think of it as an instrument of defeat in some ways. But from a biblical perspective, there is no resurrection without the cross. There is no ascension to the throne where he sits at the right hand of God without the suffering of the cross. What Satan decided or determined would be an instrument of of death, God takes and turns into the processional, the coronation ceremony of the king. It is through the cross that Jesus attains victory and is declared, as as Peter pronounces, the Son of God in power. It's through that victory. It's not through traditional means that Jesus wins this conflict. It's not through strength. It's not through might. It's not through power. It's not through seizing influence. He wins through the power of his testimony and the faithfulness of his worship. That's how he overcomes. And as people who follow him, that probably has something to say about how you and I overcome as well. We are in the middle of a war, and it's not through strength, it's not through might, it's not through typical means we might associate with victory that we overcome. It is through the power of our testimony and the faithfulness of our worship. This is a theme that we will come back to again And again, not just this morning, but throughout this series, because it is the anthem of the book of Revelation. 
And that's important to remember, especially in light of what else we read in this little snippet here. This woman, the, the people of God, she's whisked away to the wilderness. And the wilderness is an interesting picture in the Bible. If you think back to the Israelites in, in the early days, they're set free from Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They're, they're released from slavery and bondage. And they go into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, they're cared for. God supplies them with manna and with quail and with water from the rocks. We read in Deuteronomy that, that their clothes did not develop holes. Their feet did not get sore. Their sandals did not wear out. God provides and cares for and tends to his people. But the wilderness is simultaneously a place of testing. God even says in Deuteronomy, I put you in the wilderness to humble you and test you. Jesus in the wilderness, he's attended to by angels. He's preparing for ministry, but he's also tempted by Satan himself for 40 days. The wilderness is a place of safety, but also a place of tribulation. And God's people, they are safe under the lordship of Jesus, but that doesn't mean that it's easy. 1,260 days, that's an important number too. It's not a literal time. We can go back to the book of Daniel. Daniel is prophesying to the, the king of Babylon, and he says, you're going to suffer difficulty, tribulation, for time, times, and half a time, three and a half years, which in a Jewish calendar is, you want to take a guess how many days that is? 1,260 days. And in saying this, John, in the book of Revelation, is trying to tell us not how long chronologically this period is going to be. He's trying to tell us what kind of time it's going to be. It's going to be a, a time of tribulation. You are safe under the lordship of Jesus, but that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It is a time of trial. It is a time of testing. It is a time, frankly, of war. And we read that in the following verses. We're going to summarize here because there's quite a bit, but they depict this great heavenly victory that casts the dragon out of heaven, but it ends with woe to the peoples of the earth because he's ticked. And we get to verse 17. Probably the part that's most important for us. If I lost you, come back here. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman, and he went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. And in case it's not clear who that is, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. That's us, church. This is where we are in the timeline. This is where you and I presently live and where we are in the story. We live in a world where an angry dragon rages around to make war against those who would dare to be faithful to Jesus. You are in a war. And yet it doesn't always feel that way, does it? I mean, sometimes it's very apparent. But then there are a lot of times where it's like, I don't know, like it feels kind of normal. I mean, we look at Revelation and we read this, this really big cosmic picture that, that seems otherworldly and maybe a little unrelatable at times, but the reality is we experience this conflict in very familiar ways every single day. We do live in a war. That may be hard to think about because of how we conceptualize war. We oftentimes think of like bullets and missiles and bombs and one kingdom fighting another kingdom with strength and with resolve, you know, but that's really only half the picture. There's a whole other side of war that we don't often give a lot of attention to. It's, it's depicted kind of humorously in the story from World War II. It was, uh, the, the Nazis were flying during the Blitzkrieg, flying a lot of their missions under the cover of night. And they would do their bombing runs over the UK under the cover when the sun had gone down so that, you know, they could not get shot down, basically. But the British government, realizing this, they had this citywide blackout mandate all over the country. Sun goes down, lights go off. It's pitch black outside. You can't see anything. The Nazis couldn't see the cities, they couldn't see the enemy, and yet the British Air Force was shooting down an abnormal number of Nazi bombers. Like, how, how were they doing this? It was staggering, the impact that it had, and the German government was so frustrated, they did some investigation. How are they seeing us and shooting us down in the middle of the night? And they discovered the secret. You see, the British Air Force had instituted this steady and consistent diet of carrots, and carrots... We're improving the night vision of the pilots so much that they were able to see the bombers and shoot them down. So in response to that, sort of even the playing field, the Nazis instituted across the entire German Air Force, everybody will have a steady and consistent diet, including carrots. And this is how we're going to even the field and win this war. So where did they come up with this trade secret of everybody eating carrots in the British Air Force? Well, they didn't realize it, but it actually came from the British government. Because the whole thing was a lie. In truth, they had developed this highly sophisticated radar that they had equipped on every British aircraft. 
That's how they were seeing the planes in the middle of the night. It didn't have anything to do with carrots. But they would much rather have their enemies pursuing carrots and root vegetables than know the truth that there is a sophisticated technology that they need to pursue. It was propaganda and deception. And that's part of warfare as well. It's not as big, it's not as flashy, and oftentimes it's the part of the warfare that we get caught up in ourselves, which is why we don't notice it. But both of these aspects, they're very present, maybe not in these big cosmic ways, but in the everyday ways that you and I experience this cosmic war. And it seems strange. We read chapter 13, we read this beast who shows up out of the sea, this lion, bear, leopard, hybrid thing. And it sounds weird when he demands the worship of all the peoples of the earth and he just pounds on and crushes anybody who resists. And we go, really? Like, I don't know about that. But then we think about this past August, August 6th, when a friend of ours, Ajay Lal, brother of this church, who is a preacher in India, let the world know through Facebook that he had been placed under house arrest by the Indian government. The armed guards stood outside his door while effigies of his body were burned in the streets by religious extremists. He reported that his orphanage, who rescued abandoned infants, who placed them with loving families, and who met every government instituted criteria had been abruptly and without reason shut down completely. His hospital which had a much lower mortality rate than government-sponsored hospitals, had become subject of undue scrutiny from the federal government. And all of this, because Aljay is a Christian minister who preaches to thousands of people the gospel of Jesus instead of the message of Hindu in the state government. When we hear something like that, that's not so weird. That's not so unfamiliar or unbelievable. We actually don't have a hard time imagining that. And what Revelation is trying to communicate to us is that this, this idea that an institution of power would wield its might and earthly authority to try to crush the name of Jesus, that's the war. That is the violence arm of the dragon's war machine. And it is very much in operation today. But we also read about the other aspect of war, this deception. And it seems weird. We've got this creature in chapter 13. We'll talk about him in two weeks. He shows up and he, he looks like a lamb. He looks Christ-like. He looks holy. He looks like a swell guy. But when he opens his mouth, he speaks like a dragon with all the words of Satan. And he works these miracles and these signs to deceive the people with this message, go and worship the beast of power. Go and worship the beast of authority. Who is like the beast? And that seems odd. Like, Is there this dude that's going to pop out of the ground and start doing all this weird stuff? That seems unrelatable. But I would encourage you to think back just a few years. 2019, global pandemic. Fears stoked to their highest. And yet in the middle of it, without very few exceptions, every talking head on every screen had coalesced around the same message. We had questions this come from a lab? I mean, it seems like we should investigate that. That might save a lot of people's lives. Is this the result of some sort of gain of function research? And in both instances, we were told, no, no, it's not that. The government said, no, everything's fine. Now, fast forward a few years, and what we found through investigation and Senate committee hearings is that not only is it possible, it's probably what happened. And before I lose any of you, we're not wearing tinfoil hats here, okay? There's a lot of junk that came out during that time that should be dismissed and just, you know, we're not going to listen to conspiracies. This is factual information. And the fact of the matter is that an incredibly powerful cultural institution lied to and gaslit people for over a year for one purpose, to advance this idea that we should all just Just trust the government because they really care about you and they're going to save you. I don't want to be insensitive, but there are plenty of natural disasters, including Hurricane Helene, and the response to that that would seem to testify otherwise. And here's my point. I'm not here to criticize leaders. I'm here to criticize an institution and tease out this image that Revelation is trying to communicate to us. There are institutions of cultural influence that are very much in league with a dragon. They may not even realize it. 
But we live in a world that is not friendly and is not interested in seeing the kingdom of God advance. And these institutions of cultural influence, this is part of the war machine. This is part of the deception, the propaganda that we live in, designed to turn our hearts and our minds towards some Savior other than Jesus. It shows up in a lot of ways, especially this time of year. Maybe we're tempted to turn our allegiances to some sort of political candidate who's going to save us and make everything better. Maybe some man who's going to make America great again or some woman who's going to be our mamala and save us from the fascists. You can cut the tension with a knife right now, by the way. And that's good. There's a reason we chose to preach this message now and not six months ago. Because we're in the thick of it right now. We are in election season's most fever-pitched moments. And this is when it becomes the easiest to fall prey to the war machine. There is a message, there is a war, there is a battle being waged. And it's not a battle between right and left. It's not a battle between east or west. It's not a battle between conservative or liberal. All of that is a smokescreen. All of that is distraction. The great conflict that you live in the middle of is this war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. And it's not a battle waged by trying to seize the influence of political office. Nor will it be won by seizing the influence of political office. It is a war fought over something far more precious than that. It is concerned about your worship and who you will bend your knee to. We all are creatures of worship. That's how we're made. We worship. I don't care if you're, maybe you're not a true blue believer of Jesus Christ. You're here this morning because some cute girl invited you to church and that's the only reason you're here. It doesn't matter. You are a creature designed to worship. Even if your object of worship is the person who looks back at you in the morning in the mirror, we worship. And throughout human history, it's been so easy to direct that worship towards the state, towards the government, towards a kingdom, towards the empire, sometimes towards a politician or a king or the emperor. In fact, as John writes the book of Revelation, currently Caesar at that time, he's demanding that people worship him as a living God. A whole religion develops around the worship of the king. It's called the cult of the emperor. It's an insidious and incredibly influential religious institution that's invading not just the world around him, but also the church itself. It is a great adversary that John is trying to encourage the church to overcome through the power of their testimony and the faithfulness of their worship. And once every four years, I watch otherwise faithful people fall victim to the same cult. It goes by a different name. We don't call it the cult of the emperor. We call it the cult of American politics. It is a cult in every sense of the definition in the word. And we can see it in our everyday lives, how every aspect of our interactions with our neighbors and the world around us becomes politicized. I read a story this week, Reed Hastings, he's one of the co-founders of Netflix. He made a contribution, a financial contribution to a political campaign. He announced it, disclosed it, made it public information. As a response to that, Netflix subscriptions diminished, not just a little bit, they tripled. Because people didn't agree with his politics. And it's a free market. You can donate to who you want to. You can cancel what you want to do. But what I think is interesting is that our streaming services have become political divides. Our food has become politicized. There's a survey done of registered Democrats and Republicans alike to determine, does your political affiliation impact what you buy? Turns out it absolutely does. Ben & Jerry's makes delicious ice cream. The founders of that company tend to skew more liberal. They're very vocal in their political views. Not surprisingly, Democrats are 24% more likely to buy Ben & Jerry's than they are their conservative counterparts. Cracker Barrel, they skew the other way. They're a little more conservative. So conservatives, as it finds and turns out, are 11% more likely to eat a Cracker Barrel than their liberal counterparts. It's every part of our lives. It's the coffee you drink. Are you a Black Rifle conservative or are you a Starbucks liberal? Right? It's what news station you listen to. This is easy to see. Are you Newsmax or MSNBC? Every aspect of our lives, every product that we consume, the friends that we choose to keep, the family members that we will tolerate to sit around a Thanksgiving table with, 
Everything from our morality to how we view our neighbors to our priorities and values seems to be defined increasingly by our politics. And these are all things that used to be defined by the faith that we claim. And oftentimes this switch happens because we confuse our politics and our religion. It is a cult, church. The cult of American politics. Now, I'm not advising anybody to just dip out. We don't want anything to do with it. In fact, in the last message of the series, we're going to talk about what is our involvement and our contribution to politics. What does that look like? But this morning, I just want to focus on the deception that envelops the entire nation and consumes the faith and allegiances of so many otherwise faithful people. Here's the bottom line. It doesn't matter if you put your hope and faith in the elephant or the donkey, they're both beasts in the same zoo. And eventually, without exception, every beast serves the dragon. There is only one throne we bow before. There's only one kingdom that we belong to. And it belongs to the Lamb, who was slain but lives again. This war is about your worship. And worship, by the way, is more than just the songs you sing on Sunday or what religious text you choose to read. It is how you live your life. It is who dictates and determines your values and your priorities. It is the entire worldview that you sculpt your life around. That is our worship. And just like the king who came before us, the greatest weapon in our arsenal is our worship, our faithful worship. That's what this is all about. There is a dragon who seeks to claim your heart. Do not give him the satisfaction. Do not bow your knee and pledge your allegiance to any Savior other than Jesus. Let me make this very plain. Some of you have grumpy looks on your faces, so I'll just assage some of your concerns. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care what your party affiliation is. I don't care what your view on particular political issues are. I really don't. Here's what I care about. I care immensely about who you worship. I care immensely about your practice of justice and mercy. I care immensely about your extension of grace and forgiveness to your neighbor. I care immensely about your faithfulness to the king. Because that's the party platform of God's agenda. That's what we serve. That's what we advance. And this time of year, in the madness and in the noise, it's easy to lose sight of that. And I, you'll never hear me say this. i got to give the devil his due. It is a grand deception that he has woven. He says to his affiliates, you know what? We're not going to pound these people in the ground. They're a stubborn lot, those Americans. They'll just galvanize around a cause. That just won't work. So here's what we'll do. We will convince them that the best way to serve God's kingdom is to lose themselves in issues of this kingdom. Ooh, no, this, this is better. We'll convince them that the gospel of reconciliation is best represented by the divisive nature of American politics. That, ooh, that'll get them. Or my favorite, we will convince them that Jesus, who was crushed by an empire, is best served by becoming the empire. It is a grand deception. Don't fall for it. Don't play the game. Don't pledge your heart to the beasts. Recognize the lamb. Follow him in wielding your weapon of faithful worship by living like him, by representing the reconciliation of the gospel, by speaking truth with grace and compassion by being people of Jesus before you are a Republican or a Democrat. We've got a lot to talk about in this series. Next week, we're talking about the beast who deceives by posing as a savior. Throughout history, people have had this tendency to deify leaders. Every time it happens, it disappoints, or worse, they become despots who do untold destruction. We have to be wise and shrewd, church. And remember who the king really is. That's next week. Week after that, Revelation chapter 13, the second half of it, we're talking about the beast who deceives. We live, we live in the middle of a spider's web. 
We live in a culture that is woven together through institutions of influence, be it academia or entertainment or arts or you name it, that are not aiming to glorify God, but whether they realize it or not, serve a dragon. And we have to be wise enough and discerning enough to recognize it and know how to navigate it. That's week three. Week four, we're talking about the mark of the beast. What is it? Is it a barcode? Was it a vaccine? Is it a microchip that you're going to get? It's none of those things. It's it's really, honestly, we're going to talk about the mark of the lamb. We don't talk about that one as much because it's less salacious, right? But it's actually way more important in what the book actually wants to tell us about. You belong to somebody without exception. You wear somebody's name. Make sure it's the right name. Last week, we're going to talk about probably the most challenging, the one I'm most excited about. Where does Christianity fit in the context of the United States of America? What is our role? What do we do? Should we even get involved in politics? And should we care? What do we do with this? It is complicated, and yet there's a very clear call that God gives to us that has no party affiliation, that is bipartisan in every sense of the word, and that seeks to serve him the way we're called to do. We're talking about that the last week. We got a lot to get through in this series. I hope you'll make it a point to join us as we try to navigate the zoo. If I stepped on your toes this morning, it's nothing personal, all right? But hear me when I say this. Maybe get over it, all right? I'm just preaching the Bible, okay? You can wrestle with the Holy Spirit all you want. That's between you and God. But when we get up here, we're not pulling punches. We're just preaching the truth. If you want to yell at me later, that's fine. You got my email. All that said, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Oh, man, your truth is hard sometimes. But we thank you that you provide a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. And I pray that we would have the humility to follow it, just like our Lord. That the testimony of our witness would be true. We pray that the faithfulness of our worship would be consistent and untainted. We pray that you use us to be a force of good in this world, that we would not shrug it off or run away from it, but that we would engage it with the power of the gospel to bring about redemption and reconciliation in your name, that you would use your church as a source of healing in a tumultuous and divided time. And through it all, may Jesus be held high and may his name be magnified. In that name we pray, Father. Amen.